All right, so my sermon for this evening is one of those sermons that's kind of going to make me out to be a bad guy. All right, it's part of the job of being a pastor, just like it's part of the job of being a dad at home. And there's some things I'm going to preach on this morning that might ruffle some feathers or step on some toes. Uh, just understand that nothing that I say tonight is done in malice or out of anger or anything like that. And that I love our entire church and I think everything is great in our church, but there's always room for improvements. Okay? There's always going to be room for improvements. And I'm going to be preaching on some topics that are going to hit kind of to, and you know, a lot of this just has to do with how we're operating inside of these walls, in this church, just how we do things. And, um, you know, there's going to be some things that we're going to, I'm going to be preaching on and expect to have a high standard of. But everything that I preach, I'm going to try to do my best to, to consider for every individual here. And we all, we all ought to have this attitude and this mindset where when you're dealing with yourself and your own standards, you should be very, you know, I would say it harsh or very strict or have real high standards for yourself. But when you're dealing with other people, you have a lot of mercy and grace and, and, you know, not necessarily, you know, require the same standards of them that you do of yourself, right? This is the, the spirit and attitude I think hopefully we all can have so that you have that, that mercy when other people aren't maybe doing things as well, but that you personally are going to say, I am going to do my best. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing this, or the reason why we start in 1 Timothy chapter 3, right? 1 Timothy chapter 3, it goes over the qualifications of bishops and deacons. And then at the end, look at verse number 14. It says, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, one of the things I love about our church is that we truly have a church family here. And I believe that. that like, everyone cares about each other and loves each other and I think gets along really well with each other in general, by and large. Now, I may not know about, you know, if there's some people may not get along or something. I don't know. In my opinion and what I see, I think everyone pretty much gets along great and we work really well together. And I love that about this church. But sometimes now, when you have a real comfortable setting and everyone's real comfortable with each other, you can kind of let things deteriorate on making sure we're keeping up with the things we need to keep up on. Right. The more it starts to feel like home, you know, sometimes at home, you could kind of let your home just turn into a big disaster and a big mess or whatever. But you don't let your house be a big disaster when you got company coming over. Right. I mean, it just kind of this, this is an illustration. Right? This is how, you, how, how I'm trying to relate this. Well, at church, right, we're a big church family here, but we're always expecting guests to come in. Right. So we want to make sure that the church is looking nice and decent and in order and that everything can be in its place and that, you know, that everything is going to look right and that we are also well behaved and that we know how to behave ourselves in the house of God. You know, we don't worship a building. The church isn't about the building. It isn't the building. The church is the people inside. But there is something to keeping some regard and some respect for the place that we congregate and treating some things as being holy and being a place where, okay, we're gathered together. We know that, you know, this isn't, we can meet at any building. It doesn't matter. But you know what the building we meet at? It ought to be, we ought to take care of it. We ought, we ought to care about even the appearance of when people come in. Is that the most important thing? No. The most important thing is your heart and your soul and, your, you know, and, and those things. And that's what we, we focus on. But we don't want to just let everything else go either. So this is where the, the, the heart and the spirit is coming from today. And I'd like to just kind of ratchet things up, you know, a little bit. And also turn if you would to Colossians chapter 3. Because this goes really broadly. I'm going to be applying it mostly just in-house. But this concept of wanting to be excellent and having excellence in all that you do, I think should permeate all of your life. I think everything that you do, whether it be service to the Lord or not, you ought to be approaching everything in a way where you are doing your best and that you can provide excellence in the things that you do. When I'm at work and I do things on my job and I do some mundane tasks and stuff, I tell you what, I want to make it be excellent. 
You know, part of my job is just making sure people have computer. You know, I have an IT job, so I'm making sure people have monitors and computers and keyboards and stuff like that. And you know, I could make it functional and just forget about the rest and just be like, okay, well, here you go, and just throw some stuff together. But I want to do the best job I can. I want things to look professional. I want things to look good. So I take the cords and I wrap them up and I make everything look real nice because I care about because I care about the job that I do. If I'm going to put my name to something and I'm going to do something, I want it to look good. I want it to be done right. I don't want to have to go back and do it again. And this concept or this principle is taught here in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse number 22. The Bible says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. So this isn't even talking about something spiritual. This is talking about according to the flesh, right? You have a servant, you have a master, you're working for someone, you're their servant, right? Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. So he's saying even in just, you know, fleshly things, even in, in areas outside of, you know, walking spiritually, you still should have this mindset that, hey, when I work, when I go to the job, I'm going to work not as just trying to, to not as eye service. So we said, what is eye service? Eye service is when the boss is looking at you, then you look real busy, right? You, you put up the appearance of being busy, and you try to make yourself look like, oh, man, I'm doing a lot of work. But you're not really doing anything or you're only doing it when they're looking at you. What this is teaching is that you do it all the time as if you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. That you be a good worker, that you're a good employee, that whether someone's looking at you or not, you know, you're not doing it just to please men. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Because if you're going to invest your time and do anything, you ought to strive for excellence and not do things half-heartedly and not just give up and not just say, oh, whatever, right? Let's not have that attitude. And, this, and like I said, this applies to everything. Maybe you don't go off on the work. How about at home? You know, you're raising children. Do it with excellence. You're teaching your children. Do it with excellence. You're cleaning your house. Do it with excellence. You're coming to church. Do it with excellence. You're straightening up the rows. Do it with excellence. You stick around and you, you know, everything that we do, every aspect, even the little things, Let's try to do it as if we're you know, working for the Lord. I mean, imagine if the Lord Jesus Christ was going to come and inspect a job that you were doing. How would you want it to look? That's the way that we ought to be acting and be thinking about with all that we do. Now, the Bible said where we started, I know I had you turn to Colossians 3 already, but in 1 Timothy 3.15, it said that thou hast to that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And when it says the house of God, it says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Church is a very important place to be. Okay, church is a place that, has, that is the pillar and ground of the truth. And it's a place that we ought to have respect. And how about if we're going to do things in church and do things decently and in order, it can start with the service time. You know, the service times haven't changed in a very long time. Church starts at 1030 in the morning and 4 p.m. in the afternoon on Sundays and 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And they're printed in the bulletin. They're printed on the, I believe, on the window outside of the building. We've been doing this for a real long time. If we got to keep things run decently and in order, how about showing up to church on time? And not coming in when the singing's going, not coming in halfway through, not, you know, let's just start with that. And you know what? That's a real simple thing to do. That is a very easy task to do. And I'll tell you what, I understand fully when, you know, especially when you start having a lot of kids and stuff, it's just hard to get out the door. You got this going on and someone did this and someone doesn't have pants over there. And, you know, you got chaos going on at home. But I'll tell you what, there's a real easy solution to this. Whatever time you get started, if you're coming in late every time, just get started 15 minutes earlier than that or whatever it is. You can still have all of the same chaos going on. If you get started just a little bit earlier, you'll ensure that you could get here on time. We were, look, I used to be notorious for this. Okay, I'm going to confess my faults to you. My wife and I, a long time ago, were notorious for that. We'd be showing up right at the last minute and sometimes we'd make it and sometimes we wouldn't. 
until I finally just said, you know what? We just have to get ready and leave earlier. And that's it. Whatever, because we had a time on the clock where we knew like, okay, we have to leave by this time. And then it's like, well, that time came and passed. And now, you know, it's like, and that was the time where if you don't make that time, you're late. <laughs> that's not going to work. If, you're, if you think it's important, if you want to be here, if you think church is important, because I'll tell you what, church is more than just sitting through the service too. Church is the people. So getting here a little bit early, staying a little bit late, talking to people, catching up, how are you doing, how are things going, seeing on the well-being of everybody else in church is also important. And there's time to do that. I'm here Someone's always here to have the building open a little bit early. You come 10 minutes early, 15 minutes early, 20 minutes early, whatever, and people will be here. And I'm not saying you have to do this. And, and, and please don't take this the wrong way either, okay? I like to preach excellence. I want to teach and preach the, the best way, the right way, what I would like to see everyone doing. But I don't want to just have a church that's full of rules, where it just always says, well, this is the rules and you got to do this. I don't want that. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to preach these sermons and and someone has to do it. Like I said it's me and and you take it or leave it. Hopefully you can take it, apply it. But I'll tell you what too. You know, we don't need the attitude of someone else, you know, someone not being guilty of some things or whatever and then going, "Well, hey, didn't you hear what the pastor said?" you know, and like like you don't need that. Just like at home, when I, when I, if I rebuke any of my children, their sibling doesn't need to come up and start rebuking them like, did you hear what dad said? Look, that's not your job. Okay, there's a reason why I'm going to do this right now once and that's it. And again, you know, it's not, none of, not, no one thing individually is like really that bad. And if this is all the problems that we're ever facing as a church in general is just these little things, this is awesome because there's churches have lots of really bad problems and we haven't had anything, uh, anything really bad. So um, how about, you know, showing up to church on time is the first one, cleaning up after yourself, right? Having just some common basic respect for the area that we're in and, and everybody else that's here. And I'll tell you what, we have volunteers that help out, and I appreciate all the help of the volunteers. They, they write on the calendar, they're scheduled, they do a really good job of making sure everything's clean after service. But you know what? You can help out quite a bit if you just make sure your area is cleaned before you leave. You know, all the half-drunk bottles of water and, and food crumbs and everything else, you know what? Why don't you just take it upon yourselves before you leave? It takes 10 seconds. Scan your area. Hey, look, we're leaving this stuff, this trash behind. Why don't we just take care of it ourselves? It doesn't take much, but a little bit it goes a long way. And it's going to help out. the. I know the people appreciate they're sticking around to do all of the work to clean up behind everybody else. If you see something, just take care of it. There's a lot of things you don't need to get permission to do. But I'll tell you right, if you want to clean something, you don't need to get my permission to go clean anything. Have at it. You see there's a mess in the bathroom, fix it, clean it, do it, right? It's our church. It's not just, don't just be like, oh, that's someone else's job. You know, if you're visiting, it's someone else's job, all right? If you're not like part of this church as a member, that is someone else's job. I don't want you doing anything, okay? But everyone here that's, that's normal, regulars, you're members of this church, you know, what do you think about our visitors? Do you want them having to do anything? No, we should be serving, that's what the church is here for. We're ministers. So let's make sure that everybody here comes in, they feel welcome, and that the place is in order. And that we're running and operating decently and in order in the house of God because that's what God commands. That things in church are run decently and in order. Let's have respect for the common areas. Uh, also, you know, church is not a time during the service. It's not a time for eating, drinking, chewing gum, playing games, right? Let's be serious. Let's be sober when it comes to this stuff. Now, again, there's going to be some areas here where I know that we have two services and I know a lot of people drive here and, and are going out. We're going soul winning in between. There's a lot of work being done. I'm not saying don't drink some water, right, to stay hydrated, 
during service. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You're putting in a long day, a lot of time and stuff. So by all means, my point is, you know, let's not make this a cafe or a restaurant inside the church building while service is going on. After church, great. We can pull out the tables. We do this all the time. You can pull out some food. We'll use the space because the space itself isn't, you know, like this isn't sanctified ground that we're walking on and we all have to take off our shoes. But we want to still treat the space with respect so that things can be done and, and look good so that we use it for the purpose we need to use it for. If it's eating, we use it for eating. But when we're done, we clean it all up, right? And when we come to church, it's time for church, okay? And there used to be a day when people had more manners in general and kids and, and everyone just knew, you know, like, like hats. And I don't see, you know, like that's not a problem here, but just, just these things that are basic manners, right? You're taking off your hat. You're not chewing gum. You're, you know, you're sitting up straight. You're paying attention. We have, uh, you know, church is a time for learning. Turn if you would to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14 is where I get the title of my sermon. Uh, the title of my sermon is Decently and in Order, because that's what we're trying to do in the church house is keep things run decently and in order. And 1 Corinthians 14, you know, just to get the overall context, 1 Corinthians 14 is talking about speaking with other tongues. Okay, and I'm not going to go into all of that tonight. Maybe I'll do that next week. It's actually a good topic. I haven't done that in a long time. But for this week, tonight, we're not going to go into all the rest of the context. But it, it, he talks just real briefly, he talks about, you know, if people have a revelation or they want to preach, they want to say something, he's saying, you know what? First of all, if they can't speak the language, they need an interpreter. They need someone else to come up and interpret for them. And then you're going to have people preaching in order. It's not going to be like everyone just standing up and, no, oh, I got a word from the Lord. Oh, I got a word from the Lord. And people just, everyone just kind of chaos, right? It's chaotic. It's not a circus. Things are being done decently and in order, which is, which is the, the thrust behind verse 40 there at the end of the passage where it says, let all things be done decently and in order. And pre prior to that in verse 34 and 35, it's talking about the women keeping silence in the church. It says, for it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience. It also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. And again, the, the surface meaning of that is, I think is very clear. It speaks for itself. I'm not going to get into all that either tonight. The point I wanted to draw from this passage, though, is that this is the time of learning, right? When you're in the church and it says, if you're going to learn anything, you know, let them ask their husbands at home and things being done decently and in order in the church because there's teaching going on. OK, so here's another thing to remember is that if we want to, to if we care about other people and the teaching and the learning, you know, we need to be also considering distractions that are going on within the church. Now, we are a family integrated church, and I love that we're a family integrated church. Amen and amen. I love family integrated churches. We endorse, and I, and I preach on this, that we should have children in church with their families. In order to do this, it requires some long suffering and some patience by everybody involved because kids inevitably will make noise. It happens, right? So everybody has to exert patience and we don't need to be given evil eyes and evil stares because someone made a peep or, you know, whatever. I get it. However, however, we also need to show respect unto everyone else in the church that's here to learn and parents over your own children need to learn to teach and train. One of the reasons why I like we have a family integrated church is because it does teach the kids to sit still in church. And they ought to learn how to sit still in church. It's something that, that ought to be taught. And I'll tell you this much too. Teaching and training children to sit still in church, church itself isn't the best training ground to do that. It's not. The best training ground is going to be at home. And then you bring them into church as you're practicing it at home, teaching kids how to sit still in their chairs. And at home, you can start when they're little and have small amounts of time, right? 
whatever is appropriate for their age level. Because not all kids are capable of just sitting still for an hour. Depends on the age, right? But if you sit them home, and look, I, I want to help you, okay? And I'm not saying that my kids are all perfect either. They're not perfect, and I'm not demanding perfection. What it is, though, is a mindset by the parents and by everyone else in the church. One is that we're going to show some grace because it's important for the kids to be here. It's important for them to hear the teaching of the Word of God. It's important for them to learn how to sit still for a while because these days, kids, all they get is just video games and all this other media and all this other stuff, and they can't even keep focus for, for 10 minutes, let alone for an hour to sit still. And you know what? That is something that needs to be, you know, the world's going to go down that path, but I'm not going to go down that path. And I don't think you should. I think it's a bad path for kids to just go down this path of just all you have to have to keep their attention is something blowing up, something flashing, some music or something else. We need to get back to people just being able to learn to sit and be patient and, and, and sit through services. So, but at the same time we have long suffering, you know, parents need to observe your child starts making a lot of noise and becomes distracting for everyone else, it's time to take the child out. We have rooms set up. We've got a foyer over here. Okay, we leave that door open on purpose. And it's easy to take some children out and still hear what's going on in service. And sometimes you need to do that because little kids, it's a lot harder to, to contain, right? And you could do some back and forth. And we've got a mother baby room also. And this is designed primarily for nursing mothers. But if you're having problems with your children being able to sit in church, you know, take care of that at home and start the training. And everyone else is going to need to be aware and understand that, that that change doesn't happen overnight. And we will always have issues like this because hopefully our church is going to continue to grow and we'll continue to have new people moving in. And not everyone is just well churched from, you know, cradle to grave. And that these are going to be new things and people are going to need to learn how to do this stuff as they come to church. So we're going to have that grace and long suffering and it's worth it. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Okay, and that's one of the primary text verses that we, that we use for having a family in a great church. But it's not just that. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons for it and I could go into all that. But we don't want our church auditorium, just like we don't want it to be a restaurant or a cafe during church. It's not one big nursery either. It's not. We're, it's a training ground, and people are here to learn. So um, let's be cognizant of that and being aware of that. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But training requires work, right? These things don't happen. On, they, they, have, they require attention. Okay, you can't come to church and expect your kids to sit still if you never expect them to sit still at home. And... We want to, like, we go out to eat. Here's an example, too, just in general. Um, how many times do you go out to a store, you go out to eat, and you see kids just running rampant and being disobedient and throwing fits and everything else? You know, shame on the parents. And if you have kids that act like that when you go out in public, then shame on you. Because you need to be able to control your household. You need to be able to control your household no matter, no matter what. And these days, it seems like, like, it's not like we have the best kids in the world. I know we don't have the best kids in the world, but at least they know how to sit still in general when we go out to eat. And what I think is odd is like how often we get complimented. I'm just thinking like, they're not even like that good and we're getting these compliments. And I think it's just because there's so many that are just being so bad these days that it just makes <laughs> it makes the people who even aren't that great just look like they're superstars, right? When, when the pool's just going down of like what you expect when people go out. And, and I'll tell you what, this is going to be an easy solution, but it's not the right one. When kids are acting up, just give them a device. Give them a phone. Don't do that. Don't do that. That will not help the problem. Again, it goes back to the attention span thing. If you need them to be able to sit still and be quiet, you, there's there's I know it's hard to understand, but it's like we have this concept of like, man, what would you ever do if you didn't have a phone? People have been around for thousands of years without these devices and gadgets and all kinds of stuff. 
and they raise children and they're able to do it just fine. And you know what? Kids will be just fine with all, without all of that extra ad entertainment and toys and everything else. You don't need all that stuff. And they don't need it in order to be quiet. And they don't need it to be well behaved. And you know what? You ought not to have to bribe children to do something. You ought to be in control of your house and you tell them what to do. And that's where the appropriate discipline comes in, in correction. Because at the end of the day, you've got to be able to speak the children's language. And the Bible teaches not to spare the rod. And that's, and that's it. Now, look, I love my kids. And I love them enough to let them understand that there's consequences for their actions. And obviously, appropriate spankings and disciplines... We're not talking about injuring them. We're not talking about anything like that. It is the swift punishment on the rear end that's going to sting. It's going to make them cry. But you know what? It's going to be the betterment of them. And they're going to understand and be able to, uh, to be disciplined because they've been disciplined. <laughs> disciplined enough to sit because they've been disciplined. Do this at home. Um, and do the training. And look, it's going to take time but you need to be able to do that. That's what training is. Um, oh, turn if you would to turn if you would to Second Corinthians chapter five. Is there a shorter sermon this evening? But there becomes a bigger burden on parents the more children that you have. Things become harder as family. And, and I'm, I'm sure that the Logans will attest to this too. I know that we do. You know, the more children that you have, uh, in some respects it gets easier as kids get older, but then there's also, it's just, I mean, there's just that many more people to watch and take care of. So while, again, on the one hand, you need to have the mercy and, and, the, and the long suffering when people come in and have large families. But on the other hand, from the, from the perspective of someone who has a lot of children, you know, we need to be demanding of ourselves saying, you know, the world already disparages large families. The world already has disdain for families. You know, I know that my wife gets looks, all, she tells me about it all the time. Like they'll go out shopping or something and people make nasty comments and bad remarks because they see a woman with, with, you know, with six kids in tow and the world just, for whatever reason, now they've just come to just start hating kids or whatever. And the Bible teaches that children are an heritage of the Lord. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are a good thing. We believe that here. And I believe that here that children are blessing from God. They're a good thing to have. The Bible says, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Children provide joy. They're a blessing. And you know what? Having your quiver full of them. So God's not putting a limit on, well, you shouldn't have too many kids. Hey, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Amen. We know it's a good thing, but let's not give the world any extra ammunition to start hating on big families, right? So when you take them out and you can't control your kids, it's just going to reinforce their thinking on, yeah, see, they can't even, you know, no, we're going we're gonna to have our family raised decently and in order because one, then they will be more of a blessing to you. They won't be just a big burden and a big headache. And see, that's why the world doesn't want to have more. You know, people go, oh, man, I had two and I couldn't handle that. It's because you're not training them right. You're not spending enough time with them. You're not disciplining them. You're not doing something right. Because if you're raising your kids right and if you're teaching them right from wrong and you're spending the time with them and you give them the proper punishments that they need when they need to be punished, children are a blessing. They really are. But don't, you know, you can't be raising the kids that just, it's an embarrassment to go anywhere with. Because that's going to reflect on the parents. Now, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20. The Bible reads, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. 
we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. And the reason why we're turning here is basically three main principles I wanted to hit on. One is behaving ourselves properly in the house of God. One is doing things with excellence, right? Whatever you do, whether it be spiritually or not spiritually, doing things to the best of your ability. And three is understanding and remember that we're representing Jesus Christ as believers in Jesus Christ. All that you do is going to come under examination and scrutiny. And the more you live outwardly that you're a Christian and the more that people can see that you're, you're making decisions based on the Bible, the more representative you are of Jesus Christ. So having that understanding as well, we want to make sure that in all areas, we can have a good image. Now, again, it's more important to have a good heart and hopefully that good heart is going to work outwardly also to work on the image as well. But something in many cases, you know, the image part is even easier than the work on the inside. They're saying, like I was talking about, you know, showing up to, to church on time. That's actually a really easy fix. Not eating and making a big mess. You know what? That's an easy fix. A lot of these things are just real easy things to take care of. And when we're considering ourselves as being ambassadors, I would hate to have people turned away because of some really small things that, um, that ultimately in the end, like I said, they're not the, the, you know, the worst thing. It's not, that big of a, it's not that big of a deal, but it's still enough. And we see enough principles in the Bible to remember, hey, we're ambassadors. We're representing Jesus Christ. And you know, this plays through in all areas of your life, whether it be your marriage, right? How, how, how well you're, you, you, got, you could get along with your spouse and how much that shows. And, and are you having a biblical marriage? Your family, are you, do you have your household in subjection? Do you have your household uh, functioning properly and, and um, everyone's in order when it comes to your job, on the, on the job, at work? Are you known for working real hard? Are you known for being good on the job? Or are you known as being lazy? You know, all of these things will reflect ultimately on how you are as a Christian and, and then back on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be a living example of how Christians behave. And, you know, we, we all need to work together on that. And like I said, er, you know, everyone's going to be at different places also spiritually and, and need to be able to show that level of, uh, of grace. But Here's one last tip that's going to go a long way. Whatever your attitude is personally is going to help other people to show a lot more grace and mercy. If you have the right attitude, like when people have an attitude of improvement, trying to do better, trying to do what's right, being considerate of other people, you know, being able to say, oh, I'm sorry, whatever, and, and, and actually actively care about doing things better, whatever that may be everyone's going to, it's going to be a lot easier for people to have mercy and long suffering and be like, oh, it's okay. You know, versus if you have an attitude that's just flippant and you don't care and just like, well, whatever. Well, my kid just made this big mess. Whatever. We're out of here. Or my kid, you know, I just did this or did that and, and you just don't care. That's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. It's going to make it a lot harder. And it's going to make us a lot harder in general to work together as a church. Have the humble mind care about what we do, care about all the things that we do. And you know what? Even go, th this applies. And like, I could just keep thinking about different areas where this applies to. How about this? Because this just came to my mind. You know, we go out knocking on doors and talking to people. We're ambassadors for Christ. We ought to strive for excellence in all that we do. So if we're going to, if we're going to be an ambassador, you're going to strive for excellence. How prepared are you to give the gospel? Practice at home. Memorize some verses, okay? Know what you're doing. Know where you're going in the Bible. Be able to teach. How about this? When we're going out to people's places, are you just walking all over their property? I mean, maybe someone's got a nice lawn that they actually care about, and you may not care at all. I mean, I know I don't care. I got weeds and stuff in my lawn. It's not that big of a deal to me, but they may really care about that. Do you want to just, just offend them and just go walking all over their stuff and not caring about their things or knocking stuff over, you know? Be respectful to other people. Have excellence. You're an ambassador. You're representative. And you know, you're representing our church. You're representing the Lord. There's a lot of things that you're representing in all that we do.
Be mindful of those things and do everything with excellence to the best of your ability. No one's going to be perfect. We're not expecting perfection. And again, you know, and going back to distractions and stuff, I know people spend a long time here and it's hard for kids. You go from the morning to the afternoon and they're expected to sit still. I mean, we just had our kids on this trip and like, you know, I'm, God bless them because we were driving, you know, we drove home like seven and a half hours. No time to run around and lose some energy and do things like that. And I'm thankful they did all right, but it's like, you know, we're aware and everyone needs to be aware that this isn't all always easy for everyone. But as parents, you know, and as Christians, we, we need to have a high standard too on how we're going to do things. And this isn't all about kids either. This is about everybody individually and, and how we operate here and how we function. And, you know, I'm happy with how things are going, but I just want this to be on, on people's minds as well that we can be considerate. To be considerate of everybody, of everyone else. And if we have that mindset, then, um, then we're going to do great. So let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this church. God, I thank you for bringing together all the members of our church here. Uh, it truly is a family. And Lord, we're here to serve you. We love you. We want to just do our best. And, and um, God, I pray that you would please just, just help that to come through. Help us all to, to have consideration one for another, Lord, and that, and that our, our children would grow up to be great godly people and that you would uh, just bless our church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.